Welcome to the Teeth Chatters podcast, where we chat all about the correlation between oral health and systemic health. My name is Sarah Giuliano. I have been a registered dental hygienist for over a decade. Now I'm about to branch out from the dental chair into the community to all you beautiful, amazing people. Together, we can connect the body to the mouth through educational podcasts. So let's get this show started. Hello, my lovelies, and welcome back to another episode of Teeth Chatters. I have a very special guest on the show today. My special guest is Dr. Charles Reinertsen. Dr. Reinertsen's passion project is bridging the medical and dental divide when it comes to oral health's impact on our overall health. He believes people can prevent larger health problems by starting with proper oral care and wants more dentists as well as doctors to communicate with each other about their patient's overall health. Dr. Reinertsen did a TED Talk on this subject as well. He recently started a non-for-profit organization called the Dental Medical Convergence to educate patients about this very important topic. So just first and foremost, tell me a little bit about yourself, because we had never had the opportunity to meet in person, so I would love to know who you are. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm I'm now a retired dentist, but still practicing dentistry uh, full-time as far as, yeah, just about three weeks ago. So it was all new to me. Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. No, I I, uh, uh, graduated the University of Florida back in 1979. So it was 42 years of dentistry and we've seen a lot of changes along the way. And uh, I'll never forget the, 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 uh, when we got into clinical, some of the students went to the instructors and said, asked the question, what about infections in the mouth? Aren't they going to get in the bloodstream? Yeah, at that time we were told, oh no, there's an oral barrier that keeps them out. Uh, Just like there's a blood brain barrier, just like there's a placental barrier. Well, if they're finding oral bacteria in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, there's not much of a blood-brain barrier. If there are stillborn babies every year that are full of oral bacteria, there's not much of a placental barrier, and there is no oral barrier. So when you have an infection in your mouth, it gets into the bloodstream. So it wasn't until about 2012 that I saw some DVDs from uh, AOSH, the American Academy of Systemic Health. And uh, it connected the dots. It's like, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense. And so uh, uh, that's what got me interested into it. And we've been, I've been pushing this ever since. And, and it's interesting as you explain the connection to your patients, the compliance for their treatment goes way up because now they realize it's not just for a better smile, fresh breath and chew your food better. It has to do with their heart. It has to do with their, their pancreas, with their brain, with everything. So, uh, so that's kind of been the, the journey that I was on. And um, the thing that happened a few years ago that really turned me on to getting this message out was I spent about uh, four days in the hospital as a patient. I picked up a bug in an airplane and, and uh, it just wasn't going away and I ended up in the hospital. And I asked every doctor, nurse, and administrator for four days does the health of the mouth have anything to do with the health of the rest of the body? Nope, nope, news to me, never heard that. Got to one cardiologist who was like, absolutely, there's a big link. And I thought, well, we need more than one doctor in this whole hospital to get it. So I thought, wouldn't it be great to have a dentist on staff where you could do oral examinations on the patients when they're lying in their beds so that you could at least rule out the mouth as a source of the bacteria that's causing their systemic issues. Right, and actually, if they do have oral health issues and complications, that can increase their systemic disease as well, too. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, uh, I applied to be on staff, and my first letter of rejection (laughs) said that I wasn't certified by the American Board of Dentistry, and only 1% of dentists are. I, that, that, I said, this is crazy because there is no American Board of Dentistry. Every state has a board. So I went back to him and I said, would you explain this? How can 1% of dentists be certified by an organization that doesn't even exist? 
They're like, oh, we're sorry. You can apply again. Oh. They didn't want to do it. I love you. Just kept poking and poking. Oh, yeah. Good for you. I love it. Love it. Keep talking. <laughs> so so I, I applied again. And then they had me taking courses on blood transfusion, insulin regulation, other things like that. And um, I said, I'm not going to be doing any of that. They said, well, if you're going to be on staff, you have to take the courses. Okay. So I took the courses. It came down to a final meeting with me and about 12 of the doctors. And they all agreed that, yes, the mouth could play a role in your health, but they didn't want me coming in and diagnosing things that they could not treat. I said, wait a minute. Every week I diagnose things that I can't treat. I refer that patient to someone who can treat it. Their answer, we don't want to be in the referral business. Oh, my gosh. That really bothered me. Oh, absolutely. Because absolutely. Because it about the patient or about something else. Absolutely. I so, couldn't agree uh, more, right? Yeah. Then I went around to local physicians' offices saying, "Can we? Uh, in, would you at least include the mouth when you're examining someone's health to see if that could be the source of the some of their problems? Just get a dental health report from the patient's dentist, or develop a relationship with the dentist where you can refer someone to that dentist and find out do they have oral infections that could be affecting their heart, their their pancreas, or whatever." And the number one answer I got from the physicians were, we don't have time to do that, Chuck. We'd love to, but we just don't have time. We only have so many minutes per patient per year. And by the time we ask all the questions we have to ask, we can't get in, into that. So I thought, well, if the hospitals aren't going to do it and the doctors are too busy, then we need to go directly to the public. And, and my uh, target audience really is families. <laughs> because when one person has a heart attack or a stroke, it doesn't affect one person. It sure. affects the whole family. Absolutely. Everybody's life is turned upside down. Absolutely. So if we can prevent some of that, that to me was, that's, so that's what's pushing me on, on the whole thing is, is let's get the, the message to families. Well, and it's interesting that you say that because that's actually why I started this podcast because I had been a dental hygienist for over a decade and, you know, I would see my patients and they would come in the office and I would just see they would come in and I'd say any medical changes, right? You know, it's our it's our protocol question, any medical changes, any medication changes, any surgeries. And, and they would say to me, well, why, why does that matter? All you're doing is cleaning my teeth. Why do you have to ask? And I always would say, because what goes on in your mouth can affect your overall health. Well, I don't understand how, you know, and they would argue with me. And I would sit and take the time and educate them and understand that, yes, if you have periodontal disease, you have an increased rate of heart disease. And people don't understand that. There's actually a video that I had watched recently on um, the Dental Medical Convergence website. And this was really interesting that you had talked about gum bacteria and how it affects cardiovascular disease. And then you'd also said that teeth bacteria can affect you and increase the rate for heart attacks if you have certain kind of bacteria. Can you just kind of explain that a little bit since we were just talking about heart health? Sure, sure. In fact, uh, you mentioned the website. If you go to the dentalmedicalconvergence.org, we've got many, many, many uh, links that go to the research that shows that shows exactly how the bacteria affect the heart, how it affects the the pancreas, how it affects the brain. So, uh, but no, it, it, what I tell patients is the same blood that is running through your gums and through your teeth is also running through your heart and through your brain and through whatever. If the factory up the river is polluting the river and you're getting your drinking water out of the river, even if the water tastes good, should you be concerned? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Ask Absolutely. the people in Flint, Michigan about that, right? <laughs> right. Absolutely. So you can have a problem going on, and, and what happens what happens in Vegas may stay in Vegas, but, but what happens in your <laughs> mouth goes through the rest of your body. I love your sense of humor. You're <laughs> It's so fun. It's you know, true. it's great because you are delivering your message in such a positive, enlightened way where I do feel that you are reaching people significantly. And I commend you on that because I had just started this pet podcast a few months ago. And for someone who's been doing this their whole life, I just think it is such an honor to have you on because we need more dentists. We need more doctors to really bridge that gap. 
Well, the, the the challenge is physicians were taught that the dentist has the mouth. You don't have to worry about it. And to some extent, that's true. I mean, we have the teeth covered. We have fillings and root canals and crowns and, and bridges and parcels and all those things. But we don't have the bloodstream covered. And, and that is the biggest, that's the communicator through the whole body. I don't know if you've ever been, been put under for any type of surgery, but when they say count backwards from 100, you know, 100, 99, 90, and that's about it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's how quick it takes that um, anesthetic to go into your arm and up to your brain, just a matter of seconds. Well, how long does it take bacteria in your mouth to go to the heart, to go to the brain, to go to the pancreas, to go to the liver? Seconds, just seconds. And uh, this is what we try and help people understand. It, it's, it's not a separate part of your body. In fact, what I tell physicians is that if you think the mouth is not part of your body, when you go to work on Monday, leave your mouth at home. <laughs> I love it. Please tell me that they laugh at you. <laughs> they look at me like, yeah. I love your sense of humor. You can't do it. <laughs> no, you can't. Nice try. No, but I think that that is phenomenal. So obviously when you first, um, you know, went to dental school, you had awareness of the oral systemic health correlation. But you had said back in, I believe you said 2012, I want to say that you had said is when you really started to notice that. What enhanced that knowledge for you while practicing within the dental field? It was actually the DVDs from AOS, from the American Academy of World Systemic Health. That's what was, was my first trigger. And uh, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, all of the things that we believed. See, I was a Boy Scout. And in Boy Scouts, we took first aid. And one of the things you have to do is you have to clean that wound. You don't just bandage it up and cover You clean that wound and you have to make sure it's clean. And uh, the same thing is true in the mouth, the whole body. So it doesn't matter where the bacteria is coming from, whether it's it's your arms, your legs, but your mouth, but it has to be clean. And it's interesting that you say that as well, too, because I know you know as well as, and as myself that a lot of people do avoid going to the dentist until they're in pain, correct? We know this. Not everybody, but we yeah. know a lot of people do because they're not in pain. But I want you to explain to our audience, because I know this and you know this, but maybe some of our listeners who are not in the dental field, that you don't always have pain when there's an issue in your mouth. 90% of dental infections have no pain. That is a big deal. Gum disease does not hurt. I got people coming out, the lower teeth are wiggling back and forth. They breathe out, the teeth move out. They breathe in, the teeth move in. You know, yep. you can pull them out with your fingers. They've I know. been going on for a long time, okay? Sure. But there's no pain. Right. And this is why uh, the older I get, the more I like pain. And what? let me explain that. I, <laughs> I heard never, that on the TED Talk you say that. <laughs> yeah, I never like to cause pain. But it's the right. best motivator I've ever found. So, sure. Uh, so what people will, will, it's the squeaky wheel sometimes. And uh, if, if pain is what motivates you, then you have to wait for the pain. But it's so much more comfortable, less expensive, and more convenient to avoid that and just prevent it in the first place. I always say that to my patients. Let's be proactive, not reactive. Yeah. We need to be proactive. I tell patients that the more time you spend at home taking care of your teeth, the less time you spend in the dental office. The less time you, you spend at home taking care of your teeth, the more time you spend in a dental office, the more money it costs you, the more everything. So you decide, and I, I told patients, my goal is to take as little money from each one of you as possible, but I need your help to do that. And if I don't get your help, I've decided I'm willing to take just as much money as it takes to get you healthy. <laughs> And at that point, it's on you as a patient because I warned you. Sure. I told you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, I can't go home with them every day, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's just it. And that is, that's why it's so imperative for us to educate, educate, educate. I'm 
always been a advocate for oral health education because I know the impact it has on their systemic health. That's why I love talking to you. I feel like we're cut from the same cloth. You just have so many years of education and I love that you go all around. When did you start doing um, TED Talk and podcasts and blogs? Like, When did you really decide to branch out, not just within the dentistry and the community, but a much broader scale? Well, I, uh, some years ago, I actually uh, had a website called yourfilthymouth.com. <laughs> I and, love it. <laughs> uh, so we did a lot of podcasts. In fact, we've got links in from the, uh, the Dental Medical Convergence website uh, going to that one, too. But we've got many podcasts. It just So it's been, golly, four or five years. And someone had to fill the void. And again, my, my target audience is not physicians or hospitals. Uh, so many, so it, it, we're in a, a real change that's going on right now. It, it's hard to find a, um, a doctor that doesn't work for a corporation. Okay. It's hard, and dentist is going the same thing in dentistry where the uh, corporate is buying, you know, the, all many of these office and there's nothing wrong with, with making a profit, but sometimes if that's your only motive or your biggest motive, uh, you know, so if where's the, bring, where's the wellness of the patient at that point? The, the, uh, how would how would you like your family treated? You know, how would you like that taken care of? And so that that's that to me is the biggest thing right there. If we, the more prevention we can do it, the, the better it is for everybody. Now, the dentist may be afraid I'm going to lose money, but there is enough replacement work out there and enough neglect on that. You're going to be busy for the rest of your life. This is absolutely. You know, yeah. Right. I think that and I think that that's great that and especially now with you having been new, newly retired, which, by the way, congratulations. <laughs> I hope that you have a lot of fun free time, too, as well, and are doing some great hobbies and enjoying it. You're in Florida, correct? How's the weather there, by the way? <laughs> Beautiful. I went with a nice long walk with my dog this morning. It's about... Uh, right now, I think it's about 81, 82. Oh, um, my goodness. So beautiful, beautiful day. I'm envious. I'm, <laughs> I'm from upstate New York, so today it feels almost a bit like a fall day. <laughs> it's a little chilly, but the sun is shining and it is beautiful, so I will take that. You don't shovel sunshine. No, you don't. I love your optimism. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you are just so awesome. So the other thing is, why is it so critical to have a dental cleaning and dental exam prior to surgeries? Well, our immune system is always working. And uh, we have little things going on inside our body that we're not even aware of. I mean, th th this, this machine that we live in is just incredible. What a miracle. And uh, so it's always fighting something. And the more effort it has to put into fighting oral infections, the less reserve you have for fighting other things that happen for you. Now, cardiologists are pretty uh, consistent with asking for a dental health report before they do surgery on their cardiac patient. Not always. It's amazing how many patients I've had come in that just had, you know, stents placed or maybe even a valve replaced, and they've got horrible teeth and nobody ever asked them about their mouth. And that just, that, that buyer bothers the fire out of me. Well, it bothers me as well, too. And even after someone, you know, would have surgery and I'd say, okay, you know, did you take your pre-medication? And a lot of them say, well, what do I need that for? Yeah. And that, that really bothered me as well, too. And I would never feel comfortable treating a patient unless I knew that they had clearance from their cardiologist prior to me treating them. I just, I wouldn't. Well, I was having dinner. This is a great experience for me anyway. I was having dinner with a, a local cardiologist. He was sitting right across the, the table from me, and I said, if one of your patients has an infection in their leg or their foot, are you going to do surgery on them? He says, oh, no. I said, well, how about if it's in their, in their hand or their, or their arm? Is, is that okay? He goes, no. I said, well, how about if it's in their mouth? They don't know it, and you don't know it. Are you still going to go ahead and do surgery? He was a very caring cardiologist, and I could see the wheels spinning. Yeah. You, you saw him looking. <laughs> And there was yep. a pause, and the next thing out of his mouth was, every one of our patients needs an oral exam. That's all I'm saying. Exactly. But he worked for a corporation, and the corporation doesn't agree with that. So he can't do that, even though he may want to. So uh, that, that's why we're going right to people, to the, to the families. Absolutely. And, you know, I always say the more you know, 
the more you understand, the, the better you live, you know, because it's true. How else do you know unless you learn? Oh, That's yeah. my theory. Yeah, you know? yeah. Wow. The so, mouth is the biggest polluter of the bloodstream. It is. And people don't understand that. Pe people think that the mouth is the cleanest part of the body. And I always say, oh, no. <laughs> Not even close. It's like the worst. <laughs> well, ask, ask a, a doctor, would you rather have a dog bite or a human bite? 10 out of 10 will tell you I'd much rather have a dog bite. Their mouth are much cleaner than humans. And you get a human bite, people that work in, in prisons and things like that, that's, that's not a, a good thing to have happen to you. Sure. So if you could, if you don't mind, could you share a couple cases with me that you've had over your career where you've seen that direct correlation? This was before I understood. This is back in the 80s. I had a, a gentleman come in with, with severe periodontal disease, severe, and um, nothing was savable. It was that bad. So uh, we put him on antibiotics, removed his teeth, and up until that time, he had no energy. He was sluggish. He, he, life just wasn't that good for him. Took the teeth out, and about three or four weeks later, he came in. He was all peppy. He was, he was feeling completely different. And in my mind, remember, this is before I connected those dots. It's like, wow, this, it, it does make a difference. Um, I had another lady that was on dialysis she came they were having a hard time getting her bleeding to stop when they unhooked her from the the dialysis machine her medications weren't working well um, she had no pep in her step she was an artist she hadn't wanted to draw, to draw for the last two years and so uh she came finally she had a toothache she didn't have a toothache for years and years and years finally she had a toothache and so she came in and we looked at her and Sarah, you don't have to be a, a dentist to look in the mouth and say, oh my gosh, what a mess. You know, anybody could do that. We ended up removing all of her teeth, except I was able, able to save two lower cuspids for anchors for a lower partial. Um, so what we treated her with was we put her on antibiotics, got the infection under control, went in and removed all the bad teeth. In about three weeks, again, about three weeks later, she came back in and was talking about, well, they weren't having any more problems with the bleeding when they unhooked her from dialysis. That had gone away. Her medications were working better. She had pep in her step. She wanted to draw again. Her life had, had turned around. And what bothers me the most about this is that she had been, been seeing physicians on a regular basis for years. Not one doctor had looked in her mouth or asked her about that. Because again, you anybody could look at this mouth and say, oh my gosh, what a mess. Not one doctor had done that. It took a toothache to get her into the doctor. So there's a couple, I mean, I had a, I had a and I mentioned this in the TED Talks too, a, a nurse who uh, the only medication she was on was for high blood pressure. So uh, she came in as a new patient. We did an examination on her. She had a big old abscess on number 18, lower left molar absolutely no pain had no idea what was going on and you've seen this you know infections with no pain and so uh in this situation there was so much bone loss around the tooth the tooth was not savable so we put on antibiotics a few days later removed this bad tooth and again about three weeks later she came in and said guess what i don't need my blood pressure medication anymore well you know could a tooth infection raise your blood pressure and an infection anywhere in your body can raise your blood pressure. Your body is trying to fight that. So, uh, and what's the side effects of blood pressure medication? Xerostomia, dry mouth. So what happens when you get dry mouth? Now you don't have the saliva to dilute the bacteria, the acid that's being produced from the bacteria. So your cavity rate goes up, your gum disease rate goes up. So by not, by only treating the symptom and not looking for the source, the physician actually made the situation worse for the patient. I agree. I agree. And that's what I love about your approach is because you're treating it at its root, at its root cause. And if you can increase the health of someone systemically, why not? <laughs> right? To, to, us, that's, it, to us, it's a no-brainer. But I also know that we do live in a different world. And unfortunately, that's not always the case because unfortunately, you know, dentists, like you were saying, are taught to focus basically from the neck up. I remember being back in school as well, too, you know, and it's the same thing. We were only taught about the anatomy and physiology from the neck up. 
Well, don't worry about anything else. Don't worry about anything else. Just focus on that. And you get so fixated on that that you do lose sight of what it's doing systemically. Yeah. And physicians are, the ones I've talked with, they've been receiving as far as dental education from one lecture to one day. That's it. Wow. So, and what is that? Right. Yeah, that's... that's, <laughs> that's oh, how they, frustrating. They, 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 because the, the dentist has the mouth covered, you don't have to worry about it. Well, if you ignore the mouth, the body's going to have more diseases. That's a fact. Sure. Right. Absolutely. And also, too, I mean, we're talking about bacteria as well, but think about just inflammation in the mouth as well. So you think about that when you have oral inflammation from the bacteria that migrates systemically and increases inflammation and disease as well. So I know that we're talking a lot more about bacteria, but a lot of times people are not fully understanding that that bacteria does increase inflammation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you've wow. got rheumatoid arthritis. You have so many other things that are sure. respond to in inflammatory responses. So. I did a podcast recently on um, rheumatoid arthritis and Obviously, you know this as well as myself in doing tons of research on this and knowing that the bacteria, that, one of the main bacteria that cause periodontal disease is P. gingivalis. We know this. And that they're finding that in the interstitial fluid and synovial fluid of rheumatoid arthritis patients. And also as well, too, around the heart, you know. Have you learned anything recently with Alzheimer's disease correlation as well? I have heard that I know they have found oral bacteria uh, in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, and now they're and now they're thinking that has a relationship. And I, I can't recall the other protein that it's reacting with, but uh, the 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 uh, research is continuing to connect the dots uh, more and more between oral bacteria and Alzheimer's and how it affects and. Just think, it, it doesn't matter where the bacteria goes. Let's just clean up the front door to the body. This is the front door to the body. Physicians are quick to recommend you get your back door checked with a colonoscopy. But they never ask for the front door. This is where everything comes into the body. Unless you have cuts or sores or wounds, you know, it's coming in through the front door. So uh, I want to rename the mouth to the front door. <laughs> or the mirror. Right above there. The, the right. eyes are... Or the mirror to the rest of the body. I like to use that analogy as well, too, because when you, look into, yeah. when you look into the mouth, it says a lot about what's going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you, like you were saying, you had patients that came in and, you, oh, you know, even if you aren't a dental professional and someone opens their mouth, a lot of times you can tell just, you know, what is going on in someone's body just by looking at their mouths. Well, I've told nurses, if you've got a patient that has really bad breath, don't walk away from that patient. You need to walk up to that patient and let's find out what's causing that bad breath. Usually it's periodontal disease. Well, if you got periodontal disease, now you have cardiac issues and all these other issues that come from that. So, you know, let's look for the source, not just treat the symptom. And so much of medicine today is just treating the symptom. And you're gonna have a lifelong patient if you only treat the symptoms. But if you get to the source, the patient may get well. I was recently reading a book about the, you know, mind-body connection and how everything is obviously one. And a lot of times, most people in medical, dental, wherever you are, tend to separate them. And they were saying that if you have systemic issues and you are put on medications, what that does is it does suppress the issue. Um, it doesn't necessarily cure it. So what happens is it's suppresses it on more of a superficial level well unfortunately the disease may still be present and if that's the case it just migrates lower and lower and lower so that's also something I thought was to me when I read that I was blown away with that until you eliminate the source it's only going to yes. get worse I agree I agree. That's true in anything in life, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> it's like it's a big balloon waiting to pop, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So let's talk a little bit. I know I when I, again when I listened to your TED talk, I loved it. Why do you feel it's so important to you know brush, floss, and really have optimal oral health care? Obviously, you're a dentist, and I'm a hygienist, and we push for that. But you were saying that you know to brush and floss at least two minutes is not enough, is what you say. So can you just elaborate on that? What I recommend, and again, I'm sure there are dentists who are going to disagree with me, but what I recommend is one time a day, one time a day, thoroughly, thoroughly cleaning your teeth, which includes brushing, it might include flossing, it might include directed water irrigation, it might include interproximal brushes, it might include whatever it takes to get the bacteria off of your teeth without damaging the tooth of the gums. But you can't do that in two minutes. You can't do that in three minutes. It takes eight to 10 minutes if you're gonna be thorough. And then what I recommend, and we give this away to all of our patients, is disclosing tablets. How do you know if you did a good job? If you take a test and it's never graded, you have no idea how good you did. In your mind, you got an A plus. On paper, you might've got a C minus. So, so um, this way we can, we can test it. So we do this with all of our patients. Um, clean your teeth as thoroughly as you can chew up one of the tablets or use the solution, rinse your mouth out and, and look and see how good a job you did. And if you have stain on your teeth, that's where you missed. Or I'm not saying you missed, that's where you didn't get the bacteria off. You can still brush an area, but if you're not thorough, you're not gonna get the bacteria off. So you have to spend some time doing it. So I would much rather have somebody spend eight to 10 minutes one time a day. So take those two or three times a day that you were doing it before, because brushing only gets 60% of a tooth. Okay, you, you, you don't get interproximal with brushing. And so uh, I ask people, how do you clean your teeth? Well, I, I brush. I said, well, how do you clean in between your teeth? Well, I have an electric toothbrush. Well, that's great, but you're still not getting in between the teeth. Well, that's an expensive one. Well, no, that's, that still doesn't get there. So you have to show them. And, and again, most people think they're flossing, but they're popping. Popping is when you, when you pop the floss in between, you pop it back out. Flossing is you have to wrap that rascal. You know, you've got to wrap the, the floss 180 degrees around one of the two teeth and slide that up and down and do the other one and, and check yourself. But if, the, if, if parents will do that and if they will teach their kids how to thoroughly clean their teeth when they're younger and make this a habit, not only are you going to save thousands and thousands of dollars, which I'd much rather have the family spend on the family, but you're also going to be healthier. They've shown that when kids miss school because of a toothache, their grades suffer. When kids miss school because of a, a planned dental appointment, their grades do not suffer. It's hard to study when you're in pain. I've always been passionate about educating the patient and really talking about their systemic health. I always was very big on um, also like their diet as well because we know that that can pay, play a huge role. I would get a lot of patients that would come in that were big, you know, soda drinkers and things like that. And I really would work very hard to make sure that they cut on that because I would tell them not only is it impacting your teeth, what do you think it's doing to the rest of your body? Sure. Five things that I think we need, five things that we need to be healthy. Number one, what we eat. You said diet. Number two, exercise. Doesn't mean you have to join the gym, but you got to move every day. Number three, a healthy mouth. You don't need a Hollywood smile to have a healthy heart, but you need a healthy mouth to have a healthy heart. Okay, number four is a good night's sleep. Our body does its best healing when we're sleeping. And number five is our attitude. And the attitude actually controls all of the other ones. So, uh, but uh, I'm focused on number three, but the other ones are just as, or at least equally, equally important. But you have such a fabulous attitude, so that is huge. And I think because you have such a, a bright personality and you're very positive about your delivery when you go out and educate, that people are willing to be receptive to what you have to say because you're very genuine in your delivery. You're not dictating. You're just trying to enhance people's knowledge. So that is phenomenal. And the fact that you're doing it is fantastic even though you're retired. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter who's right, but what's right. It's not about me. I'm not the expert. By any means, I'm, I'm a messenger. That's my job, it's just a messenger. 
the experts, look at the, the, the research that the experts have done. I don't know if you looked into uh, uh, Drs. Bale and Donin, some of their work on the beat the heart attack gene. Oh my gosh. I mean, oh, that's is. I mean, now you're getting into the, the experts, to the researchers, to the scientists that really- To back that up. It. Yeah. Right, but to but to back up that correlation and convergence of the oral systemic health. Yeah. That's yeah, fantastic. They, yeah. So I have a question about saliva. Let's talk a little bit about saliva. We know that saliva is the first line of defense in your mouth. And we know how important it is to have a good salivary flow. And I know you had touched upon, you know, someone that had had high blood pressure and you know that she was on medications and the fact that we know that that can increase dry mouth as well as so many other medications. So how, let's educate, you know, others, like again, who are not in the dental field, how important it is to maintain and have a healthy salivary flow. And if they don't have that due to systemic health issues or medications, what can they do to help with that? Well, they've made a number of products over the years. Some of them have, uh, work better than others. And what I told the patients when they, when they are on these medications that dry out the mouth, uh, we really can't take them off of the medication. That's not our responsibility. So we have to deal with whatever symptoms they have. And so they make a bunch of different products from sprays that you can put into your mouth to pills that you can suck on. Um, I really like xylitol. <laughs> Me too. They, I yeah. love it. So uh, anything that we can do to, to, well, first of all, if you don't remove the bacteria from the teeth and you don't have the saliva to dilute the acids, you're getting concentrated acid, more concentrated acid put, being put on the tooth surface and down into the gums. So, so uh, the first step is if you have a dry mouth is you got to keep your teeth squeaky clean. I mean, you, do. That's, you have to that's work harder. One. Yeah. You have to work harder at your home care. Yeah. yeah Life I is agree. not fair. Right. <laughs> Life is not fair. Right. So we have, we have to deal with what we're dealt. Um, so uh, that's the first thing. And then I tell them to try the smallest amounts of some of these different products that are, that are on the market and find out which one works best for them. Because one product may work fantastic for one person, but not so good for the next person. So uh, I would do the same thing with denture adhesives when we're talking about, you know, denture adhesives. I say buy the smallest amount of several different products until you find one that you that, that works best for you. And the same thing is too with, with artificial salivas. Uh, years ago, they actually tried putting reservoirs into dentures that you could put, put uh, artificial saliva in there just to keep it moist under there. That didn't work so well, but they've been trying to do different different ways of getting that mouth wet because that's important is we don't the skin inside the mouth is totally different from the skin outside the mouth absolutely it is and i think that that's fantastic too because obviously in order to treat your patient as a whole obviously we know that if they have systemic health issues they are on medications and things like that and we know that they can dry them out you know, orally. And it's important for us to educate them even more, as you had just said, because again, they have to work a little bit harder to have optimal home care. You know, I would always do that as well with my patients, perhaps that had diabetes that was not well managed. I would always say, okay, let's, you know, let's do periodontal maintenance with you, scaling and root planing. And really, I want to see you more frequently because hopefully if we can manage your periodontal disease, hopefully your diabetes might be become better. So in that seems to really, you know, patients were very receptive to that, especially when they did have systemic health issues. They're like, yeah, let's try it. Well, once <laughs> they understand the why, and this is, you know, we have to explain the why. If we just tell them, do it, why? Because you told me to. No, no, that's not going to work. You know, uh, so they have to understand why, whether it become home care with diabetics or, or any of the systemic, why is oral health so important? Once they get it, their life changes. I agree. And then you're enhancing that knowledge and education, and they bring that home every day and incorporate that into their home care which is what our That's objective the is. That's the yeah. idea. So do you yeah. ever go, do you ever, I know you go out and educate in the community. Do you ever go to local schools and speak to younger children? In the past, I did a lot of that. But after COVID, it was more challenging getting into some of the schools. And now it's, it's, it's 
quite challenging getting into some of these different uh, schools to, to talk with the kids because that's where you want to start. I would love to be able to have an educational uh, uh, session for the teachers. And then once the teachers understand it, then they have a better chance of helping their students to understand it. So uh, uh, to me, that would be a good thing. We're not, I'm not pushing any products. I'm not pushing any particular office. I'm not, you know, this is, this is, this is strictly for the individual's personal health. Your, your delivery and your message is authentic to what you're passionate about. And that is what I love about that. Because you are, you're very authentic, you're very genuine, and I again, I think your personality is very bright, and your approach is incredible, and people, I'm sure, would be very receptive to hearing it. I'm receptive, and we just met. <laughs> <laughs> so wonderful. let me a- <laughs> let me ask yeah. you a question here. How how vital is it to young dental students and medical students? to have some form of curriculum that can bridge that gap into their structural academic programs? If the goal is to have the patient be healthy, then it's essential. If you have a different goal, then maybe you don't want to do that. I understand where you're coming from with that. But I think, like you were saying back when you were in school or even up to recently, like they would have like a day or two lecture on if they were in dental school, they talk a little bit about the body for one day and vice versa, you know, and and what is that? (laughs) Not enough. My first year of dental school was a combined medical dental class. So we it was basically med school for the first year. So we took the exact same courses right with them from, from biochemistry, gross anatomy, everything together. And then after the first year, you split off and you never saw the other ones again. And the communication was just, is, is missing. And that is, it's a vital link. If a healthy body, a healthy person is the goal, we have to include the mouth. We have to include a lot of things that we're ignoring. Uh, when I've asked with physicians, they said they don't get training in the mouth about about oral things. They don't get they don't really focus much on on uh, diet or on exercise. So if you're leaving out diet, exercise in the mouth, you're going to have more diseases. What about sleep? When you were practicing, did you um, ever have to advise a patient to say, you know, you may possibly need to have a sleep study and, you know, oh, delve absolutely. into sleep? Yeah, I, yeah. Because the, again, the they're, yeah. right. And again, so we see the patients in that supine position, which is somewhat of a sleeping position. And we can look anatomically in their mouth and see if they have any obstructions or anatomical obstructions or pooling or a large tongue or large uvula and we could say wait a minute how you're sleeping at night yeah no absolutely no and and so many about from the the statistics that i've read show that about 80 percent of the people that are recommended to wear a cpap won't wear it for different reasons Uh, i had a a good friend of mine back in 1987 not wake up Uh, his his wife sent the kids and go wake up daddy well, daddy was gone. And uh, at that, back in the 80s, they didn't know that much about sleep apnea. Now you realize some of the problems. One of the things in, in, uh, in dentistry, uh, you would, they used to do a lot more extractions for orthodontics. You, you measured the teeth, you measured the arch. If there wasn't enough room, you took teeth out. So you've made the arch smaller, but you didn't make the tongue any smaller. Well, the, the tongue has to go somewhere, and sometimes it goes back. And so you can have obstructive sleep apnea when you're lying on your back. You have less trouble when you lie on your side. But uh, it definitely affects the rest of your, your, your day on how you feel. I had a patient one time, we were talking about sleep apnea, and she said her brother is a truck driver, and he thought he had sleep apnea, but he didn't want to get tested for it because if you are tested, now as a trucker, They give you a whole different set of rules that you have to follow. So he didn't get tested. He fell asleep at the wheel and killed two people. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, that's a horrible. That's it's you can't undo that. So uh, I think it's important to. Yeah, that's why I said one of the things we need is a good night's sleep. 
They make mandibular advancement devices that bring the lower jaw forward, open up the airway. I mean, most sleep apnea is obstructive sleep apnea. Some is central, where the brain just doesn't tell you to take a breath. You need a CPAP for that. There's no doubt on that. But if you can just open up the airway a little bit, many times you don't need that CPAP. In fact, I had a patient that was going on vacation. This is years ago. They were going to Greece. And he said, I don't want to take my CPAP machine. I said, well, let's make you a mandibular advancement device. So we made that for him. He hasn't used the CPAP since. He doesn't need it. He pops that thing in. He's got an open airway. Yeah, it's working. So, uh, and the compliance is, is much higher than with a CPAP. I agree with that as well because I've had patients say that they feel as if they're claustrophobic in that or they feel that it dries them out too much and they wake up and their mouth is so dry and, and things like that. But I love your approach where you say, okay, well, your CPAP isn't working, but so let's try this. So essentially, you are helping him treat yeah. his sleep apnea yeah. and making it manageable for him by him using that mad appliance, which is fantastic. Oh. And if the CPAP is working and you like it, keep yes. stay with it. Keep Absolutely. With it. Right, and that's what they say. It's like the Ferrari of all for sleep, for sleep apnea is the CPAP. But if you don't tolerate it, that's lovely that they have an alternative just in case. And if you wear it all night long. Some yes. people will say, you know, I wear it for three hours, then I can't stand it, take it <laughs> and off. And you well, rip it off and it's on the floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not I doing know. any good down there. I so, know, you're so funny. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so we've got, and, and another area we didn't talk about is occlusion, the bite. Because if your bite is not right, you can have neck aches, headaches, popping, clicking, um, all kinds of problems. And uh, so I spent a lot of time with occlusion. And uh, I use a device called TechScan. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but it's a computerized, computerized bite analysis. When you're using articulating ribbon, did it mark? Did it not mark? Was the tooth wet? Was the tooth dry? Was there ink on the thing? You know. Um, whereas with this uh, computerized sensor, it shows you where you're contacting, the sequence that you're contacting, and the force that you're contacting. So you see a lot more with that than you would with just articulating ribbon. It's amazing how many occlusal interferences are causing all kinds of other issues. And once you get the bite adjusted right, then the, the symptoms go away. They're well. Isn't that interesting? As well, and that would also help if somebody is perhaps a mouth breather as well, right? Uh, but, well, if they're possibly. I don't have an answer to that. I don't know for sure. Okay. Um, my oldest son, I remember when he was, um, he has really bad allergies. And when he was younger, I took him to an orthodontist and they actually gave him the, uh, the palatal expander because he had yeah. a very narrow vaulted palate which was perfect for him because it opened him up. It gave him more yep. room in his mouth to open up that airway. And, and he's been great ever since. Um, so I think that that hopefully, you know, is helpful as well, too. There's a YouTube video, I believe it's called Saving Connor Deegan, I think is the name of it. But it's a young boy who was diagnosed as far as, oh, he was, he was a problem child. You know, he was uh, he was in trouble and, uh, well, come to find out, make a long story short, he wasn't able to, to get a good night's sleep. And so once they expanded his palates, once they cleaned out his sciences, once he was getting a good night's sleep, um, his whole attitude changed. Connor Deegan, yeah, saving Connor Deegan was the name well, of it. I'm going to check that out because I think that that's incredible because a lot of people will, you know, parents are saying, well, you know, why is he acting up and why is he falling asleep in class? Well, there's always an underlying reason. Let's like, Again, it comes back to let's get to the root cause of it. Yeah, let's, let's get to the source. <laughs> Let's yeah. get to the source of the issues. Okay, yeah. so um, I have a, a couple more questions sure. for you. So as someone who's always been passionate about oral and systemic health, I am as well too. I'm just kind of new into this. I'm still only a decade in. Um, and always having the goal to educate patients, which is my goal as well as yours. Why would you say that you are so passionate about this connection? What has inspired you to become so passionate about this? I think we're put on this earth for two reasons. This is my own thinking, and nobody else may agree with me, but I think for two, two reasons. Number one is to worship God. How you do that is between you and God. That's, that's not my, my issue. But the second thing is to help each other. And how can we help each other? And this to me is one way that we can help each other and what I'm recommending people to do 
doesn't necessarily have to cost them a whole lot of money. Let's start with the free stuff that you can do just, at home. Just an open ear and an open mind. Yeah, to, to, there you to go. listen and right and to listen to gain knowledge. That's all you're doing. It's free. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's free, you know. It's and I tell free. people you cannot complain about the expensive stuff until you until you start doing the free stuff. Once you're sure. doing the free stuff, then you can talk about the expense. But if you're not even doing the free stuff, you can't complain. Right. No, and I completely understand with that as well. And I love your approach. And I can see that you are a very bright spirited positive person and i have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation with you and i would absolutely love to do another podcast with you because i feel like we just i feel like we just hit like the tip of the iceberg today (laughs) with things (laughs) I, I really do, but I would absolutely love to do this again. So now that you are retired, tell me a little bit more about your new approach because um, obviously you're still going out into the community and things like that. So what are you doing in that regards as well and coming at it from being a reten- retired dentist? I'm writing a book. You and, are. Yeah. I love it. And it's Good for we're, you. We're directing it to families. And uh, it's not for physicians, it's not for hospitals, it's not for an insurance company, it's for families, for people. And uh, there are, you can define a family however you want, but we all are part of some family, you know. Um, so, uh, so writing the book is taking, taking the time right now. So uh, um, that's, that's the, and then working, of course, on the website, that's continually, uh, we're updating, updating, updating as we get more information. So that'll be a work in progress uh, as long as it's, it, as long as it's online. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. So. That's awesome. I love that you're doing this because you're going to be carrying this passion with you forever, I can tell, which is fantastic. Well, I heard, what do you, go I ahead. heard Ted Turner, which you may mm-hmm. know him. He's started yeah. CNN of the way, way back when. Anyway, he said something years ago that stuck with me. He said, when you pick a big goal, pick one that you cannot accomplish in your lifetime because you'll mm. always have a reason for getting out of bed. Wow. And I guess he had a couple of friends that picked big goals, but after they hit them, they didn't know what to do. And uh, I, from what I remember, one of them became an alcoholic and the other one committed suicide. Wow. And so as long as you have a goal out there, and I'll never reach this goal in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but well, because it's ever changing. It's always evolving. Yeah. We're learning more and more about this every single day. Yeah. And talking with people like you gets me even more excited, which is wonderful yeah. because it's more people that are that are on the same mission. Sure. And sharing that passion. Yeah. More voices coming together to reach more and more people, which is fantastic. Well, We're how definitely do you an how do you use an elephant? You know, one bite at a time. <laughs> I've never heard that one. Oh yeah, one that. bite at a time. That is so great. <laughs> if I eat the whole thing, you're gonna choke to death. You know, so you're so uh, funny yeah. okay okay so before we close i just am curious what do you do for fun what are what are some cool hobbies that you enjoy doing you know in your retirement well this is i've got this is a strange situation for me to be in because i've been i've had a schedule in front of me five days a week for four days a week you know and as you always knew what you were going to do now so First thing I'm doing is is working on some things around the house, <laughs> yeah. things like that. Walking my dog. I'm gonna get sure. back into tennis and some things like that. But that's balance is the hardest word that I've had in my whole life is balance because you need to balance between work and play and family and church and and other, you know whatever you're gonna do the balance. But, balance yeah. is very 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 important I think to have as almost like your umbrella goal. So if you have balance, hopefully the rest of things in life will fall in place for you. And that, I think, helps create happy, healthy people when you do have balance. Because as soon as you shift too far to one thing, you lose balance. That's right. And then you feel off and it throws everything else off. And I am learning that as well, balance. Um, career, (laughs) home life. You know, I'm learning that as well, too. Both of my children are older now. And they're going to be moving um, to Austin soon. So it again, it's just finding a, a, a new balance, yeah. you know. So, but it's exciting. Life is an adventure. It really it is. is. It There's, is. Every, every year is a little bit different. I mean, look at the last few years. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I know. It's been crazy. 
Yeah. It's just been so crazy. But anyways, this was a lovely podcast. I'm going to include every location that my guests can find you and reach you um, on the podcast. Do you have any closing thoughts for us? Three things that I'm going to ask patients, number one, or people. Number one, get an education. Try and understand how important the health of the mouth is for the rest of the body. That's number one. You have to understand your why. Number two is get your mouth healthy and your family's mouth healthy. That doesn't mean a Hollywood smile. You don't even need teeth to have a healthy mouth. But if you have teeth, you can't have infections. And the third thing is the next time you see your physician, ask your physician. In fact, it may be your dentist. Ask your dentist, does the health of my mouth have anything to do with the health of the rest of my body? And then be quiet and listen to their answer. You don't have to correct them. You don't have to tell them anything, but listen to their answer. If their answer is yes, there's a big connection. Wonderful, you've got a good doctor. If their answer is, I don't know, please send them to the dentalmedicalconvergence.org. We have a page on there just for doctors that has the links that goes to so much of the research that shows how it affects the heart, the kidneys, the lung, everything. And uh, and if the doctor says, no, nah, that doesn't have anything to do with the, re- with the rest of your health, you can decide if you want to keep that doctor or move on because it's your health we're interested in, not the doctor's health. It's your health that we need to, we need to focus on. So those are the three re- requests I have. That's fantastic. I love that. And I think that's great that you are almost, you're pushing um, patients to advocate for themselves. Yes, And I think that that is phenomenal because when we ask questions as patients, that's how we learn and we learn more about ourselves. Yes, yes, absolutely. We need to question everything. That's where I raised my kids, you know, question everything. (laughs) Just because I tell you something doesn't mean it's true. Check it out. Sure. And uh, I'm much more- And figure that out for yourselves and find that out for yourselves. Absolutely. Wow. It's about what's right, not who's right. Isn't (laughs) Don't you wish everybody felt that way? Yeah. We'd live in a totally different world. Absolutely. <laughs> oh That's a whole other podcast <laughs> <laughs> that we won't touch upon. <laughs> no, not, not yet. Well, listen, this was absolutely lovely. I would love to do this again sometime. Um, and we can just delve into this even more because this is an endless topic to talk about. Well, it's a matter of motivating people to start taking care of themselves rather than letting the doctors take care of them. Absolutely. Because we are the ones that know our bodies best. Yes, we do. We do. So I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you so much for coming on today. I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day in lovely Florida at 81 (laughs) degrees. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much. 